to uh, introduce Professor Richard King. Professor Richard King is originally from Britain. He's born in Marlborough, which is not far away from the place I speak now. And he's a graduate from Christ Church College at Oxford in 1984. He studied further in Berlin and at Cambridge. He worked in Germany and Scotland. And now uh, Professor Richard uh, King is Professor Ordinarius with focus on history of philosophy at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And among his publications I'd like to mention and encourage uh, the audience to read Aristotle on Life and Death, Aristotle on Plotinus on Memory, uh, published in 2009, and uh, other comparative works such as The Good Life and Conceptions of Life in Early China and Greco-Roman antiquity. I am actually very delighted to see a serious classicist, an important classicist, uh, with an interest in the history of philosophy and also with a sympathetic view on um, comparative philosophy or comparative reflection, uh, to put it best. So I'll uh, hand uh, out the microphone to Professor uh, Richard King. Welcome. Many thanks, um, uh, Jonot, for this very um, kind introduction, and many thanks for the invitation to speak here. So I will share my screen with you, um, so you can, as it were, read as well as listen, uh, in the hope that things will be clearer like that. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the axial age and the problem of universals. What I'm going to do is to focus on something which seems very straightforward and very attractive, but I'm afraid is much more difficult than it appears and much less attractive than it appears. Um, I think that if we look at um, uh, Carl Jasper's book, The Origin and Goal of History, written at a period when uh, Europe was largely destroyed by nationalism, and a period which also saw the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, in New York, um, we see someone looking for what is common to humans, all humans, to provide all humans with a common future, as he put it. Um, and of course, um, the problem is, what, are we, what, are we, what is he looking for really when he looks for something universal? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at two um, thinkers very briefly, Mencius and Aristotle, zoom in, as perhaps appropriate on Zoom, um, on a couple of texts and uh, actually question whether we really can um, call these um, texts universal. Um, there, are, there are limits to the extent to which nature um, in both Mencius and Aristotle in a way, and rights in the Mencius and uh, laws in Aristotle are universal. I think that this is a spurious universality. And of course, there is a, a strong supposition that universals in practical philosophy are really our concern. I mean, this is shown by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, as Chris Gill, uh, who taught and teaches, as far as I know, uh, in, in Exeter, um, where, where Jonut is, um, pointed out some time ago in a very useful article about the role of un universals in uh, ancient philosophy. They play a very different role to what we expect. We, who are burdened with Kant and uh, the idea that in some sense, the norms we use must be universal. And I think antiquity is very different. It is not just Kant, but unclear Kant. Um, one person who has tried to look at the role of universals in, uh, in early Chinese philosophy or in Confucianism uh, is Heiner Rötz. Um, and what he tried to do was to claim that uh, Confucian ethics is universal. And what he means by universal is taken from the American uh, psychologist, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, who um, divided up uh, human development, uh, of course, orientated largely uh, on American 
American uh, youth and the way they grow up and where they end up, if they're good children, is they end up with the universal ethical principle orientation, a long mouthful. The right is what is in accordance. This is the way Roots um, gives uh, Kohlberg. Um, the right is what is in accordance with abstract, consistent and universally valid principles. It is based on the autonomous decision of conscience. Now this sounds very, very um, Western, modern, and um, there are many points we could home in on in this quotation to question what is happening. What I want to do is give you a, a very famous little bit of Mencius. Um, so in the famous story of the child crawling towards the well, Mencius hopes to show what it means that we all have a heart that does not bear the suffering of others. And this is what the way this very famous text begins and, and on which I've, I've written before. Um, um, so what this text tells us is that the earlier kings, um, so the earlier kings of what is now China and uh, was in the Mencius called the Xia domains, uh, had a heart with which did not bear the suffering of others. And therefore they had a government which did not bear the suffering of others. Now, this sounds perfect. This sounds universal. This is the way all humans are. And in fact, there are other quotations um, which one can give from the Mencius which go in the same direction. Perhaps one of the more, most famous of all uh, quotations from the Mencius, uh, Renier, Renier, um, so, which I would translate as being humane, Ren, is being human. And when joined together, he goes on, it is called the path of duty. And this is a play on words, much as it is in uh, English, um, being humane is being human. Um, in the modern pronunciation, both are Ren, and they are perhaps um, also etymologically connected. So this sounds perfect, you know, this is, as it were, the core of what it is to be human is to be humane. Another translation for this word ren, meaning humane, is benevolence. Um, and it may also have overtones of actually being perfectly virtuous. But things in fact are, are rather more complicated than this. And one is the ambiguity in the Chinese word or the uh, old Chinese word ren. Um, it can be used to mean human, that is, certainly true, but it also tends to mean uh, nobles. And it can also simply serve as an indication of others as well. Now, the first quotation um, that I gave, uh, which is about a government that cannot bear the suffering of others, makes quite clear that what we're talking about here really is a small elite who run the government. Um, and in fact, the text goes on, as I'm sure some people will, will remember, that in, some people will be excluded from being Ren if they don't have the right hearts. In other words, the right uh, kind of virtuous inclinations developed into proper virtues. And so you exclude them from being Ren. Now, either you exclude them from being human which I think is something that we would find very worrying, or else you just demote them from being noble. You just make them into uh, people like everyone else who are subject to the ruler. Now, of course, what Mencius did was he advised rulers, kings and other rulers, as well as people in a similar position to himself. Um, and his addressees are very, very limited. Now, of course, he is not the only early philosopher of whom this is true. In fact, um, I would go so far as to say this is the norm. And also the connection with ruling is also extremely important uh, for early philosophers. So um, I mentioned earlier the Greeks who went to Rome in the first century BC. Philosophers do have a terrible tendency to follow the money. Um, or follow the ruler and find a ruler to look after them and whom they can then advise. Um, now, another aspect in the Mencius, which 
is at the center of many readings of Mencius, um, is Xing, so, uh, which is translated usually as nature, and is um, said by a very great authority, A.C. Graham, to be one of the terms which does have an analog in Greek, namely phusis. And both of them, of course, are connected with the idea of growing. And the importance of this for Mencius is, is enormous because um, in the traditional reading of Mencius, which is a, an important uh, restriction, um, his most important saying is Sinchang, namely that the, uh, your nature is good. And of course, when we turn to Aristotle, it looks as though there is also a similarly universal assertion about all humans, namely that we all are living things with reason, and furthermore, that we naturally live in cities. So we are politicon zoon on the one hand, and we are a zoon logon echon on the other hand. And of course, Aristotle is also someone who advised rulers. Now, the problem with this as a basis for universality is that in fact, Mencius is really um, interested not just in the fact that we are basically good in will develop to be good if allowed to. Um, what we really need to know is the concrete behavior that will arise from this. And this is determined as I suppose is very well known, uh, by rights, Lee. Now, the way these are spelt out by Mencius, and I think for the first time in, in uh, Chinese history, is according to the relations among humans. Now, these, of course, um, uh, are very um, various, and they are also rather restricted. I mean, there are many more relations among humans than those listed here. And in fact, of course, these relations have three purposes in Mencius. They distinguish the way in which um, humans differ from beasts and birds. They distinguish uh, the Xia, who, uh, which is Mencius's name, as it were, for his group from others. And it also distinguishes the Junzi, the lords and princes, from their subjects. And these boundaries are completely uh, fixed, I think, in the Mencius. Mencius is not really interested in what everyone does. And the same point, I think, can be made in Aristotle. And this, <laughs> this will worry my philosophy uh, uh, colleagues who are used to reading Aristotle as though he were a fellow philosopher whose office is down the hall. Um, and Aristotle, like Mencius, is talking to elite males, potential rulers of cities, and these cities are, of course, famously, infamously based on slavery. And these cities are hierarchical, and they are carried out, they are supported on the backs of natural slaves. Now, Aristotle is famous, perhaps above all, for, through Thomas Aquinas, uh, for his support of the idea of natural law, as he says, um, just as fire always goes up here and everywhere, so too there are things which are uh, nomos um, law among the Persians, just as in Athens. But it doesn't really play very much of a role in his own deliberations. What does play a role is his idea that um, there is a single best politia, a single best constitution, as we translate that usually. Um, but Aristotle is not trying to, as it were, colonize the whole world and turn it into a huge number of Greek polis. He does not think that his duty is to universalize everything. Now, another very famous argument in Aristotle uh, says that um, we all have a function, an ergon. And um, what this ergon is, is a, a rational activity, um, sorry, a rational activity following um, virtue. Um, and yet, when we actually look at the politics, we see that only the ruler, in fact, possesses phrenesis. Um, 
so that uh, rationality is spread out in a very differential way among humans. This is something that Dominic Scott has emphasized in uh, his most recent book uh, on, on the Republic and the Ethics, on Plato's Republic and the Ethics. Um, and it's not a right shared by all, uh, only a, a potential that we all have, um, but it may be developed into practical wisdom, but need not be. And one final point, um, there seems to be natural hierarchy in Aristotle, as indeed there is, I think, in, in early Chinese thought. Um, all relationships are based on hierarchy, and even those relationships which may not be hierarchical are within the hierarchy. So if you're on the same level as someone else, your relationship may not be hierarchical, but you're within a hierarchy. And this is based on the fact Aristotle claims in the politics uh, that throughout nature, there is a hierarchy. His main witness, of course, is the relation between the body and the soul. The soul rules, the body obeys. Now, if we were actually trying to derive anything from this hierarchy, we have to do an awful lot of what I would call specification. We would have to break this down and to explain on a way that nature does not prescribe just how these hierarchies arise. And of course, Aristotle does an awful lot of arguing about the kind of hierarchies that there must be in the city. His use of nature is suggestive rather than demonstrative, I think. So I'm not quite sure when we began, but I will now finish off um, like, a, like a good boy, I think, on time. Um, just saying that, I mean, practical thought is practical in antiquity, <laughs> at least we hope so. And uh, of course, the problems that Mencius and Aristotle were trying to solve were not ours, were not, for example, the climate crisis. And their universals, which they do have, um, they are not really the kind that we need. And we need to think about the way in which Aristotelian and indeed uh, Mencian universals uh, function within uh, their own work and how they differ in that from the way our universals function in our practical ethics. And so in a way, what I would encourage um, the comparative philosopher to do is to let the text speak rather than imposing our problems on, on them. I mean, one of the great delights of philosophy is its uselessness. <laughs> And harnessing it to our concerns seems to be a very violent and unfortunate thing to do. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I look forward to discussing uh, these problems with you. Um, the fin my final slide has some of the things I've referred to in the course of, um, or haven't referred to, but you might have seen on my slide. Many thanks. <laughs>